Hello, how's everybody doing? I'm glad for us to join and be back together again because this is the time for us to talk about what is race. Everybody thinks they really understand race already, but the reality is we really don't. We think that it's just biological, but it really isn't. And so I'd like to recap on some of the things that we talked about last week, and I'd like to be able to come back and let you know that this is a very important subject, and let me tell you why. It's because it damages the image of God when we don't treat each other in the right way. It's because we're mad and we're out protesting. It's because people are getting shot. It's because people aren't understanding what's so important about this subject. And so we have to make sure that we understand what the importance is. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at what we are talking about on this particular day. So last week when we talked and we had a discussion together, I was talking about the issues of what is race and what does race mean? And so we talked about that and we talked about the issues of race and its importance. And so we know that this subject matter is very important and very costly for us to understand. Um, I want you to know, as we're talking about this subject, that you're listening to right now Michael Reynolds' ministry. And I am Dr. Michael Reynolds. Very glad to bring this subject matter to you today because it is important. Um, my wife is the producer of our show, and I'm very glad to know that she's here with us, helping us through this process that we're having right now. So uh, we began this as we begin to look into last week, and we asked the question of what is race, and how are we impacted by this issue that we talk about when we discuss the issues of race itself? Well, what do we need to know? <clears throat> We need to know when we talk about this particular subject and what's going on is that the most important thing for us to know is we must love our theology and we must not be over, overwhelmingly in love with our sociology. What do I mean by that? We must love what God says. We must love to want to be like God. We must love what the biblical text teaches us. And not what we see with our eyes, what we believe to be true, or even what our parents have told us is true. Many things are out there that are myths about race. And so we need to clean those things up, but you need to stop getting feeds from this world and get feeds from heaven. And let God begin to tell you, because he's our creator, he's our maker, and he knows who we're supposed to be. On last week when we got together, let's do this quick uh, uh, review. On last week when we got together, we talked about the issues of biology. What did we say about it? We said we're like conjoined people. We are connected together. Some people, the old term was Siamese twins, but it actually means conjoined, two people coming together. People in the world are joined together. They are, we are the same. We're connected with one another and our DNA is connected with each other. This is what we found out to be true, that science can find no differences in people's blood, in people's body systems, and there is nothing that reliably identifies us by race. I said last week, you're forever watching the ID channel. And when you're watching the ID channel, they want to tell you, look, they want to tell you exactly what race people are. They said, look, we know after we ran their DNA that they are African-American. There is no way for you to know that I'm African-American by running my DNA. What you find out is that there are people from that part of the world that I share the same markers with. That's what you know. I share markers with people from Europe. I share markers with people from Africa. I share markers with people from Asian America. That's what you know. And so it doesn't say what race you are. It just says their biology makeup is like those from that part of the world. That's what we know. And so we have to understand that race is a created item. It is not real. And we need to understand what God really created and what God really said that we were. Well, I told you uh, on last week we were together that there's no differences of race. It is a constructed idea and race has evolved. When they first started out, there was about two or three race categories, four or five at the maximum most. And then all of a sudden, we right now today, if you look at the census, has 15 classifications for race because there's no way to tell you what race people are. So we have to keep coming up with new names and new categories. Now, this is what we do know is true. 
We know that we are 99.9% .9 exactly alike. All humans are 99.9% .9 alike. That means it does not matter how much, uh, it doesn't matter um, how much we think we're different. We're really very, very similar. Look, there's no birds, there's no fish. There's no animals, there's no chimpanzees, there's nothing that is 99.9% .9 alike but us. Let me tell you something about that. Look, even if you were to go buy gold, by the way, gold is going up in price and so is silver. But if you were to buy gold right now, the gold would say it is 0.99999 because even it won't say that it's 100%. Scientists, to their best ability, have placed this at 99.9, .9, which means we're only 0.1 unlike each other. That's how similar we are. When you look at these pictures that right here behind me, it's actually the same face. But we've been taught in a way to see color when we see people. And in that way, you begin to see different people behind me. But the reality is, that's the same person, just with a change of skin color. That's something that we need to understand, that we've been conditioned to see color and then infer certain things about it when we see it. Now, uh, when we begin to realize that, we also know this. Look, if race was so important, if race was so, uh, um, it had such a great inability for us to uh, define it and it really made us separate and made us different, well, let me tell you something down in the in, in the bottom of the screen you see a husband and a wife those kids that are with them are theirs but since both of them come from mixed history they're able to produce both dark skin and light skin blue-eyed and brown-eyed babies these are twins they were born as fraternal twins but they are exactly like each other why uh, I'm, uh, they, they're born from the same mother and father but they have differences of color because race does not matter like we think it matters. Here we have uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, we have two sisters who are born to be family members at the same time. And at the top, we have the two sisters now with their two uh, brothers that they have who are born after them. And again, this intertwingling of, uh, uh, of race that's present because it really doesn't have our skin color, because it really doesn't have the kind of story that we give it. That's what we talked about. We got into sociology, and uh, when we got into sociology, we talked about uh, the uh, biology of, of both eye color. We talked about hair color. We talked about body. We talked about skin. We talked about those kind of things last week. We identified them. I want you to write this word down because I want you to research it. I want you to look into it. We identify those things, those facial characteristics, as being phenotypes. They make up a very small portion of your DNA, which make us appear or to look different. So I said to you, does race really exist? That's where we ended on last week. And, and again, the argument is made, there is no biology that identifies our race. But yet, we celebrate our diversity and we celebrate our differences. But let me tell you what we celebrate is cultural distinctions, not biological separations. So what's significant? What's important that's here? What's important for us to understand is that certainly there's different cultural makeups. If you take a baby from Asia and you bring them to Texas and they grow up in Texas, since small babies are able to babble any language that baby will sound like and will give the sounds of someone who is from Texas, not someone who's from Asia. It is not pre-wired in the baby. In other words, it is something that is learned after we arrive here. It's part of cultural learning. And many of the things that we value so deeply are cultural learnings. So let's pause for a minute. Are there differences between the cultures? You bet there are. But those differences don't make us biologically different we're biologically the same exact people god wants to get this message to god across and god wants to say this message to us in particular and so that becomes a very important thing for us so what do we come down to this is what it comes down to it comes down to cultural differences because we have been raised historically 
through our ancestorhood, we've been raised in geographically separate places. We have had biological things that we learned differently. We have had ancestryhood that was different. And guess what? Because we come from different parts of the world, when people come from different parts of the world, we speak different languages. Those things are learned things based on when we get here. But it doesn't mean that God did not create all of us from Adam and Eve and create all of us in his image. That's very important for us to know. He created us in his image. Well, let me say something to you when I talk about that. Then what we're saying is not race so much. What we're saying is really we're talking about what particular um, descent are you? What ethnic group do you belong to? If you're Latino, you belong to the ethnic group of being Latinos. Remember, Latinos can check the box of being white. They can check the box of being black. They can check the box if they wanted to, to be brown. Because it's not really this distinction historically that we looked at for race. It's really being from a country that has been speaking Spanish. And so they are already ahead of the game. They're not locked up in their race. They are understanding that there are a group of people that have been gathered together by these distinctions. They're people of European descent. That means they come from that part of the world. Asian descent, African descent, Native American descent. And we still have, we still have the Aborigines uh, from, from um, Australia. There's still a ton of other groups that could be also included in this list. But I want you to hear that we are culturally different and that we are not biologically different because that would be a message that we shouldn't be listening to or believe to be true. Well, let me say to you this because I want you to understand how people have used these external things, lip size, uh, eye color, hair, uh, I don't have much of that, but you understand what I'm saying, and um, uh, uh, all these distinctions and they've used those to practice race for a very long time, to practice oppression, to practice discrimination. And so I want to talk to you just a minute about this chart as we start getting into what we're engaging in on today. And so this chart in particular looks at how people begin to live out racist feelings. Sometimes people say or identify that they're not necessarily racist. Well, let's look at this chart for a minute and let's discuss what it might be. There are two things on the chart. Number one, it talks about a discriminator, discriminator and it also talks about somebody who's prejudiced. If you are prejudiced, it means you have feelings and emotions that you have towards somebody. If you discriminate, it means you practice behavior against them. So in the green place that's there, if you look at the crossing, the uh, that's present, that's there, it says, look, if you are prejudiced and you're a discriminator, it means you believe that other people are not equal and you treat them that way. And so sometimes that's the only people that we identify as having a problem. But I want to tell you, there's a lot more people than that struggling with what this means. In some cases, you may be prejudiced, and we go to the bottom of the screen, and you're a non-discriminator which means you may not treat people different, but you sure believe they're different, and that belief is in your head. That belief needs to be dealt with. That belief needs to be surrendered to the power of God. Then you can be in a position where you're really not prejudiced, you really think people are equal, but you still discriminate against people over in the purple, over to the side. You are a discriminatory person, but you don't believe people aren't the same, but when you are with your friends, when you're with people who also might be discriminators, you act like them and you discriminate against people who you should not. Even though you don't believe they're not equal to you, but you discriminate against them because the system does, because the institution does, and because your friends do. And that means that you are being made and molded and fashioned after your friends and not after Christ. And so then when we begin to take a look at that for a moment, we look at somebody, a place that we'd really like to get to. That's being a non-discriminatory person and also being a non-prejudiced person. I don't believe 
that I am greater than you. I do believe that we're equal and I also treat you fair. That chart helps us understand where we need to pray and ask God to give us some deliverance. How has God, can he change us so that we're not practicing discrimination against people that we shouldn't be practicing it against? Now, we start dealing with the issues about prejudice. We must think about them in this way. Prejudice, discrimination can lodge at different places in your body and in who you are. This is the word orthopathy, orthodoxy, and orthoproxy. It simply means this. Orthopathy means the way you feel, have right feelings. Orthodoxy means the way you think, think correctly. Orthoproxy means behave correctly. Race has to be dealt with so that we act right, we feel right, and we think right. We need to have a holistic transformation in the power and the glory of God. We need to go to the altar and say, God, change the way I think, change the way that I feel feel in my heart and change the way I behave when I discuss, engage, and treat other people. Because I don't want to be a person who's disarming or treating incorrectly or harming somebody who's in the image of God. I want to know that the little ones, the least among us, are created in the image of God and they are to be honored because they are God's image. Well, that takes us to the thing that I really want to get into today and I really want to discuss today. That takes us to the discussion of theology. What does God say about who we are so that we can understand what the Lord is expressing to us? Well, let's take a journey through scripture for a minute and let's begin to understand what the Bible is really telling us about the issue of uh, theology. The first thing that I want you to know is this. And this is the first thing that we need to understand. There was only one Adam, pause, pause, and there was only one Eve. And God didn't make five Adams, and God didn't make five Eves. God made one Adam and one Eve. And from them, all the rest of the world have come. They've come from the same mother and the same father. Now, let me tell you how profound that is. That means that everybody in the world, everybody in the entire world is related. It's just how closely you are related to me. Because if we start going to fourth, fifth, sixth cousins, I'm going to tell you, you're going to see people in your family tree that are going to blow your socks off because you're going to realize <laughs> they're not even the same race you are because of the diversity that we're made up in and we all belong to the same group. <laughs> it is very true. We are of the human race. We're just one and we're all related. It's just how closely we're related to one another. Adam and Eve are the people who had you. God is your father, and guess what? Jesus Christ is your big brother. And when you learn, or when you come into the body of Christ, you share that blood, and you accept him as your father, and you accept Jesus as your brother. We need to be in the body of Christ with one another, and those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. You need to know what it's like to be in the family of God, to know what it's like to have the blood of Jesus flowing through you so you are included and not excluded from the glory of God's presence. Well, then what happens? Where does race come from? If Adam and Eve had everybody, why don't we all look alike? Why don't we all uh, uh, have the same expression and the same uh, phenotypes that I talked about before? We don't have the same ones for this very reason. We did at a time. God created one race. God created one group of people. God created one culture, and they were all together. But then the Bible tells us that it came a time that man decided he was going to build a tower into the heavens, and he was going to be like God. When he decided he wanted to do that, God said man had united together and decided that they were going to be and get the name and get the importance of God. God came down and cursed them, and this was part of what God did. He said, now I will give them different languages and I will uh, uh, distribute them throughout the known world. I'll have them leave from each other. And guess what happens when they leave from each other? They, they begin to create culture. 
Now, where they are, when they create these new, the new culture that they uh, create where they are, when people have children, their children may have a slight variation. And that slight variation becomes a difference because God made us so we could have slight variations in our DNA so that we would be able to survive. We think about this among African Americans, there is sickle cell anemia. Um, and sickle cell anemia is a disease that if you get it both from your mother and father, a double trait, it could kill you. However, sickle cell anemia was the thing that kept not only blacks, but people around the Mediterranean alive. Why? Because if you get one trait of it and you get bit, you wouldn't catch the malaria because the sickle cells would keep you alive and keep you functioning. It was something that was a trait that kept you alive. So again, it, it propagated more and more because those people had children and stayed alive. If you have a particular change that helps you stay alive, that gets propagated in your group of people. And that becomes who you become. So here it is, God separates them, not because they did good, God separates them because they were trying to build into the heavens and he changes their language so they cannot work together with one another anymore. After God changes their language and separates them from one another, let me tell you what happens next. God has designed a time to bring man back together again and to, separate, to get rid of the separation of language and make them one with each other because God's intent is that we'll all be together as one. And so what happens next is the beautiful day of Pentecost. When Pentecost strikes, when the time comes for the day of Pentecost, let me tell you what happens. This is what the Bible says. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season that the Father has fixed. And it goes on to say that we should receive the power of the Holy Spirit and it will come upon us we will become witnesses in the uttermost parts of the world. When people gather together on the day of Pentecost, the Bible said they came from as many as 20 different nations were together. Those are just the ones identified in scripture. And all these people were together with all these languages that were there. Remember, God was the one who started new languages. And on this day, People speak the language out of their mouth, but miraculously, by the power of God, people hear the language in their own ear, in their own language. Why? Because God is eradicating the separation of man and he's bringing man back together again. And this is what he says, I will make you witnesses. I will give you power, glory from heaven, so that you can come and go into all the known parts of the world. You can go against culture and you can bring the gospel because we become new creatures in him. In Christ Jesus, we become the ethnos, the new ethnic group in Jesus. And we belong to him. The greatest thing to know is that you belong to the family of God. And it is in belonging to his family that we begin to realize that the day of Pentecost was God gathering people back together again. It's right there in scripture. I haven't made anything up. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Do we believe Bible or do we believe what we want to believe ourselves? Well, let me tell you, when you do believe Bible, then you come to this conclusion. God gave the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people so that they could now reunite the people together in the name of the Lord, and we could get rid of the distinctions that kept us separated in terms of being like him. Oh, it's beautiful that we celebrate being African-American or being uh, European descent or being Native American. It's beautiful that we celebrate that, but God forbid that we ever celebrate that more than we celebrate what it means to be part of the family of God. And so here we find that God calls us into this place of saying that we need to go forth and now bring a gospel that now makes people one again. What does the Bible say in the book of Ephesians? It said that Jesus Christ came to tear down the middle wall of petition and bring us together as a new man where two become one in him. That's profound, that's great, and that is extremely powerful. So as I said to you, hey look, these are some of all these places they came from. God 
has ethnogenesis. He starts, it's ethnogenesis, meaning God starts ethnic groups. God began it at the Tower of Babel. And then guess what? On the day of Pentecost, he reversed it. And he brought people back together again. And he told them, in Christ Jesus, we should become one with him in him. That's what he tells us. Now, I wanna use something that was used by Hitler himself because he didn't really realize that what he was really saying is what Jesus can do and not what man can do. We then become the master race. We become the master ethnogenesis. We become the master calling of God, part of the master calling of God. God only made one race of people he gathered us together in him. And when we operate and move in his anointing and what he's called us to do, we are the called out ones. And what is our mission? Our mission is to pray. Our mission is to, uh, 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 to bring about healing, to bring about wisdom, to bring about knowledge, to bring about miracles in the earth, to proclaim the power of the almighty God to the world. Let me tell you that this begins to happen on one particular occasion. People begin to fall away a little bit from the time of the falling of the, uh, of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ said, I'm going away, but I will send you a comforter to be with you. And he does send that comforter to abide with us. And then on, in 1906, uh, there is this revival that breaks out. And let me tell you something. They're speaking in tongues. There's people coming from all parts of the world and they're gathered together in this old church building, and they're coming to hear a one-eyed black man, partly blind, who's preaching the gospel because God wants to show the power of the gospel is not in might nor power, it is in his spirit. And so here he proclaims the falling of the Holy Spirit. And what does it tell us? It tells us that people came from all over the world and came together, but what was the newspaper talking about? The newspapers were not talking about the fact that a new religion had started. It wasn't talking about the fact that there was somebody who was blind who was teaching. The newspaper was talking about this. Blacks and whites in 1906 are in the same place worshiping together. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit broke the cultural bondage, tore down the middle wall of petition, and brought people together. Let me tell you something. This world is hurting to hear to see the glory of God and the love of God. And they needing to see it and the church needs to lead here and get out front and show the world what it looks like when we operate in the love of God and in the family of God. The power of the spirit will take us to a place to tear down the middle wall of petition. That's what they talked about when the Holy Spirit fell and came down. Now. King begins to come and give us a message. He said he had a dream. I believe that this dream he has is a dream that we still should be having today. This is what King says. He says, I say to you today, my friends, though even, through, even though we face difficulties of, of, of today and tomorrow, I will still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out its true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I didn't need the United States to tell me that. God had already told me that I was created equal and I was created in his glory. I knew that already. Well, let me tell you something. We should be dreaming right now that God will again pour out his spirit greatly upon us so that we can tear down every wall of middle petition so we can come together as one in him. Remember, and hear me out, we need to deal with the issues of race so that we're able now to be the body of Christ, so that we can honor the image of God, and so we can bring glory to God's name, and so the world will look at us and will see, wow, those people have something we don't have. Remember, spaceships have gone to the moon, They've even gone to Mars. Remember that we've already, we already understand fusion, and we understand fission. We can split atoms and we can tear them apart. But at the end of the day, we can't even get along. Why? Because we don't understand 
the glory of God. But the church can lead here, understand it, and express just who Christ is. Let me pray with you, because I want to pray this moment with you about how we can rise above what sociology has taught us, and we can walk into the theology that God has been saying to us. Adam and Eve is your mother and father. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. Let me pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you glory and we give you praise. God, we magnify you and we lift you up. There is nobody like you. Therefore, God, we want to make sure that we're letting you go forward in front of us into this world. God, we don't want to, God, go in this world not prepared to bring the gospel and bring the truth. The truth is that we are equal. The truth is that we are called of you. The truth is that we need to honor what it means to be in the family and in the body of Christ. God, teach us how to tear down that middle wall of petition, to love one another, to care for each other, and to know where our real family really is in the body of Christ. Now, to God, you be the glory as I pray an anointing to tear down and to come against the vile and the ungodly approach, the demonicness of race, and allow God for the image of Christ to be seen when we see each other and let the world know the church has the answer in Jesus' name. Now, God, we give you glory and we give you praise. You've been listening to Mike Reynolds' ministry. I'm Dr. Mike Reynolds. My wife has helped me to produce this show, and we're together with you talking about important issues and want you to know how important they are. We're together next week. We'll be back at the 3 o'clock time. And when we are together on next week, uh, I want to tell you, we 3 o'clock Central Time, and when we're together next week, we're going to talk about how the United States has dealt with this issue of inclusion, how they've gone through the time and dealt with inclusion. We're going to look at things that have to do with integration, segregation. We're going to look at those issues. We're going to talk about them. And we're going to talk about what we think God wants us to do and what God wants us to make sure that we do. Remember again, we are created in the image of God. And therefore, it is that image that we want to make sure that we are following and following with. God, I give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.